It's good to be back together, everyone. Welcome in to Sunday here at Christ Chapel. We're excited you're here and excited to be a part. I love this community here online and know that not everyone joining in today has come here in the greatest place. I know that some of you are going through some pretty hard things, some really hard circumstances, whether that be health related, your finances, your kids, job concerns, something else, or any combination of all of it. And to you, I wanna say, God is still God and he is more. Others of you aren't in that place right now and things seem to be going your way. To you, I wanna say, God is still God and he is still more. I love how that's true, that God is still God and he is still more in the highs, in the lows, and everywhere in between. And wherever you find yourself today, we'd love to pray with you if that'd be helpful. Hard things or easy things are all things to go to God with, and we'd be honored to step into that with you. For now, let's head over, and then I will see you all in just a bit. Good morning, Christ Chapel. My name is David Coots, and it is a pleasure to be with you this morning. If you are new, we would love to help you get more connected at our church, and our Connect card is a great way to do that. And we would love for you to fill this out so we could learn a little bit more about you. Also, you'll notice in front of you, we have a prayer card. Our church believes in praying for things both big and small, and we would love to pray with you this week. If you have a request, we would love for you to fill this out. And you can put both of those in an offering box in the back. And also, if you're joining online, you can, uh, there will be an opportunity to connect and to pray in the chat. Now, if you've been with us for a little while, you've probably noticed that these cards are different. And that's because we are making some changes in our Connect ministry to help you in your journey with Jesus. Our Connect ministry will now be called the Journey Team. And our Journey Team is committed to walking alongside you. We realize that as our church's discipleship endeavor of being one, making one, and reaching one, it's an ongoing process, and so our journey team wants to partner with you and walk with you through the whole thing. And so, if you have questions about what your best next step could look like, our journey team would love to meet you. They'll be outside at the kiosk, and believe me, they want to help you be with Jesus. They want to help you serve, and they want to help you reach the over 800,000 in our own backyard. 
So uh, like I said, after service, they'd love to meet with you. If you're going to go meet them by the Next Steps kiosk. Now, if you would, everybody please stand uh, and let's greet one another. Continue worshiping now with We Bring the Sacrifice of Praise, and the choir will start us out.
sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. And we offer up to you the sacrifices of thanksgiving. And we offer up to you the sacrifices. so grateful that we can worship with joy. You may be seated. Amen. Good morning, church. I was thinking, I feel sorry for whoever has to go after that. <laughs> that was me. Man, wonderful to worship with you. Uh, last week, we talked about uh, worship and what worship was. And another definition, I know I gave you one last week, but worship is a response to who God is. 
It's a response to what he's done, and it's a response to what he's doing. And if you want to respond in a way that you worship him with your gifts, we would love uh, for you to do that, uh, to, to give as unto the Lord and what he is doing uh, in and amongst our church and in and amongst our world. If you'd like to give today, uh, you can certainly respond and worship that way by giving online. That's how Jen and I give. You can give uh, by texting in the code on the screen, or if you brought a physical gift, you can drop that in one of the white boxes is out in the great room after the service. Certainly encourage you to do that. I want to thank you, though, for your faithful generosity and faithful uh, giving because uh, your giving is making an impact. As I said last week, uh, when you give faithfully, it allows us to act swiftly. And we were able to interact and intervene with some financial needs to help those folks uh, going through this tragedy in Israel right now. And so uh, we gave, the elders on your behalf gave $100,000 to two particular organizations that we've been partnered with for many, many years, and they're helping with medical aid, uh, humanitarian efforts, and evangelistic uh, outreaches. And so, uh, wonderful things going on there. In fact, uh, tonight, one of the the presidents of one of those organizations, Tom Doyle, is going to be speaking here at five o'clock this evening. Uh, would love for you to join us if you would like to hear more about Israel. Tom is going to tell us some real-time events, some very encouraging things that God is doing in the midst of evil, uh, but he is using for his good and his purposes. So uh, you're going to hear some encouraging things from Tom, some real-time things that are going on that you won't hear on the news, uh, certainly some ways that uh, to interpret some of the things that you're hearing Tom is going to give us insight into, as well as some ways to pray. So we're going to finish our time tonight praying for Israel. So I uh, would love for you to join us. Uh, hello to all of you joining us online. That is going to be a live event only tonight. It's not going to be streamed, so it'll just be here uh, at the Fort Worth Sanctuary. So I'd love for you to join us at 5 o'clock if you'd like. But we're going to spend some time in prayer now. Uh, Certainly we are going to pray for Israel. One of the phrases that has certainly been around, I think, ever since I was born was, we all want peace in the Middle East. Uh, that phrase is, has always been around, and we talked about from Psalm chapter, uh, Psalm 122, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And we've been talking about praying for peace, but we all know true peace only comes through Jesus. There's a lot of trouble in, in the world. In fact, Jesus told his disciples the night that he was betrayed, the night that he had the last supper with them, you're going to have trouble in this world. Everybody is. But in me, you can have peace. He ended uh, the, the Last Supper with these words. He said, I've said these things to you that in me, you may have peace. The, the, the truly, the only people that can have the peace that surpasses understanding are those in Christ, those who know him and have his presence. And so we're going to enter into his presence through prayer, praying for his peace, not only in our world, but in our own lives. So if you would, bow with me, please, and I'll lead you through some things to pray. So first, uh, let's pray for peace in the Middle East. Let's pray for Israel, that, that God would squash the evil that is going on right now and put the spotlight on him and his salvation, that people would turn to him to find true and lasting peace and that the trouble would subside. You know, it was through Jesus that we are able to have peace with God. It was through his bloodshed, his body broken, that we can have a peaceful, right relationship with God. But you know, when I think about having peace with God, sometimes we don't have peace with him because we've sinned. And there's something stirring our conscience. And we need to come clean right now to clear our conscience, say, Lord, this was not right. This is sin, and I confess that to you as such. Please forgive me of that sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness so that we can 
experience that, that peace, that, that clean sheet with God right now. So confess your sins to him. And then finally, is there someone in your world that you're not at peace with? Maybe they're in your own household. Maybe they're in your family, in your workplace. Would you ask God to intervene and make peace? And a lot of that starts with your own attitude, your own heart, your own mind being conformed to the image of Christ. Paul says, as much as it is possible with you, be at peace with all people. So ask God to intervene and make peace by conforming you to the image of Christ. Lord Jesus, we thank you for being our peace. You are steady, unmovable, and unchangeable. And so we can have assurance of your peace because you do not change. And so, Lord God, until your kingdom comes, until you return, while the trouble exists, continue to be our peace because ultimately we know that you have overcome the world. So thank you for being our peace. Let us abide in your presence, please, in Jesus' name, amen.
Tell us a story, Mom. What story should I tell you? Tell us about him again. Well, it starts in the beginning. Is he the god of the galaxies? He's the god of everything. And it bows to him? Yes. And it reveals him too. From the vastness of the heavens to the delicate details of a cell. His fingerprint is all over creation. He's proclaiming who he is. And last time you said he revealed himself through his son. Yes, his name is Jesus. And we get to tell about him too? That's his design. That his people who know him and know he made all things will make him known. Well, good morning, Christ Chapel. What a privilege it is to be back together again. A privilege to be uh, sharing with you. If you have your Bibles, I love what Cody says every Sunday. Take out your Bibles. It's a great thing to hear. If you don't have a Bible with you, uh, there's a pew Bible in the seat underneath, uh, in your, uh, underneath your pew, and uh, we're on page 927 in that pew Bible. You'll need your Bibles and uh, follow along. Some of the scriptures will be on the screen, some will not. But we continue in a series in the book of Acts, and in this mini-series that we are right now involved with is uh, making God known, making the, un-God, the unknown God, as we saw last week out of Acts 17, known. Uh, he, can be, uh, he can be understood, he can be known, he's at work, and we're going to find out how t- this morning. Making him known is not always an easy assignment, and God's servants are not immune to discouragement. Discouragement is a normal part of the life of even the most seasoned of God's saints. Uh, Moses, if you read it in the Living Bible, there's a humorous way that they uh, paraphrase that, Ken Taylor paraphrased that. In Numbers chapter 11, when Moses has been uh, hearing the, the grumblings of the people, and he and the Lord are having an argument, and I love how it says it, Lord, did I, did I give birth to all these people? You know, are these kids mine? And he was very frustrated with uh, the nation of Israel. Uh, Job, if you read Job, Job uh, wished he had been born still. He wished he had been born dead. And if he wasn't born dead, he said, I wish I could have died. Uh, Because of uh, what God was putting him through testing and how Satan was tempting him, he felt, uh, really, it would have been better had I never been born. Elijah after uh, winning that great battle with the, uh, uh, the prophets of Baal up on Mount Carmel, uh, hightails it, uh, uh, fleeing from Jezebel, goes down to the south and has a, a pity party, like he's the only one left and God has to remind him, no, I've got, uh, I've got thousands who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. David, uh, David writes the, the, the lament psalms, and many of the lament psalms that are in the book of Psalms. And in one in particular, I I love the line, it says, uh, how long, O Lord, how long will I uh, wait for you? And then he says, how long do I have to be my own counselor? You you know you're in trouble when you're sitting on both sides of the counselor's desk. You know, how are you? Well, I'm not too good. (laughs) What do you think I should do? Well, don't ask me. And those those deep agonies of the soul, of the soul. Uh, David, you know, what, what a man after God's own heart but had to hightail it out of Jerusalem because of fear of his son who had rebelled against him and started a rebellion and a counter kingdom to him. And then there's the Apostle Paul. Uh, a few weeks ago, we saw that Paul and Barnabas had preached the gospel in the cities and they returned to Lystra and Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, Acts 14 says, encouraging them to continue in the faith, saying that through many tribulations, we must enter into the kingdom of God. I have a colleague uh, at the seminary who has a statement of reality when you uh, want to talk about brass tacks. He says, life is hard and then you die. (laughs) That sounds a little morbid, and it is, but it's also a bit true, a bit true. The second missionary journey on which Paul and uh, his companions are uh, embarked is not an easy one to say the least. As you work your way around that map of uh, uh, the uh, you know, Greece, Greece uh, region, 
At Philippi, he and Silas were fastened in stocks and thrown in the Philippian jail. At Thessalonica, he faced a mob incited riot of, quote, quote, men of rabble. Remember, that was Cody's favorite name for a rock band. In Berea, the, the, the crowds were agitated, so Paul was sent off in protection to Athens. In Athens, as we saw last week in Cody's message, he mixed it up for the cause of Christ in the synagogue, in the marketplace, on the, what's called Mars Hill or the Areopagus, where you had the Stoics and the Epicureans who were self-conflicting in their own theology or their own philosophies, Paul's preaching Christ in the resurrection. A strong combination of resistance, sparse results, strenuous travel, spiritual warfare, brought Paul to a level of discouragement that uh, might surprise you. We think of him as a super saint. But in his first letter to the Corinthians that he writes back to Corinth, where we'll be today, on his third missionary journey, he writes back to them and he confesses that he came in much fear and trembling when he came to Corinth. Here's an apostle who had been through the ringer. In 2 Corinthians, the second book he writes back to this church, he says in chapter 11, it's not gonna be on the screen, just listen to this, this may surprise you, he is defending his apostolic ministry against the Corinthians who were criticizing him. So he uses a little satire and a little cynicism. And he said, are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman with far greater labors and far more imprisonments with countless beatings and often near death. Now listen, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea, on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, in dangers from robbers, in danger from my own people, in danger from the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger with false brothers, in toil and in hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and in thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there's the daily pressure of my anxiety for all the churches. I love the way he finishes that. You know, it's one thing to face the ravenous wolves of the culture. It's another thing to deal with the stinky sheep within the fold. You know, as if nothing else, he said, and I'm anxious for all of you guys. Uh, Paul wasn't a super saint. God used him mightily, no doubt, in writing much of the New Testament. But Paul was human, and he went through all of what I just read in the course of his ministry, which goes all the way back where we saw when Paul was called to bear the name of Christ to Gentiles, to kings, and to uh, other members of Israel, and to suffer for the sake of the Lord. When we come to our passage today in Acts, we continue on our second missionary journey, and we find Paul at Corinth, and we're introduced to a theme of God's providence. Let me explain it up front, and then we're going to watch it unfold as we walk our way through the passage. Uh, providence can be defined as God's purposeful sovereignty. It refers to how God works in unexpected and unseen ways, both to encourage and embolden his servants, but also to accomplish his mission in the world. Providence comes, uh, our English word comes from the Latin root of pro meaning before and vidar, which means to see, to see it before. God, God will see it ahead of time. God will see to it. He will take care of it. He will supply what is needed. <coughs> Interesting, <coughs> excuse me, back in the book of Genesis, when God asked Abraham to take his son Isaac up onto a high mountain, you know, it was a test of Abraham's faith to offer him on a sacrifice, all the while knowing what God was going to do. There's a ram that's caught in a thicket, and that's what he sacrifices, but it comes with an announcement of what God's going to do in the far future with Jesus Christ, and it's God's going to provide that sacrificial lamb. And the text says, God will provide, in Hebrew, literally, God will see it. God will see to it. There's a difference between providence and miracle. Miracle happens when God suspends the laws of nature to intervene beyond human possibility or causation. But providence is God's supernatural governance of what happens naturally, natural phenomena, even human activity to accomplish his will in the world. The doctrine of God's providence teaches that God 
orders everything in the universe according to his sovereign will to display his own glory. Everything happens for his reason, both the big things and the little things, the good and the evil. Nothing is outside of his control. Ephesians 1 verse 11 puts it this way, God works all things according to the counsel of his will. Don't miss that. God works all things. Natural disaster, human warfare, misfortune as we would think about it, God hasn't lost control. And that's why Romans 8, 28 is such a comfort to those of us who are believers. It says, God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. So to stay faithful in the face of adversity, one needs a developing appreciation for God's providence. We're gonna see in our passage today how God orchestrated the convergence of place, people, and even political policies to facilitate the mission of God in the world to take the gospel to the world. <coughs> Excuse me, one of the ways God provides is in the team that he assembled around the Apostle Paul. So I've divided this passage into four ways, and I want you to watch the providence of God in each. Number one, in the value of a team. It says, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. You'll see some other verses and parts of verses there, but I want to stop right there. God led Paul out of Athens to go to Corinth, of all places. This is no small statement. Why, when he was depleted and discouraged, and we're going to find out a little bit later in the passage how God ministered to him, why would God send him to Corinth, of all places? It's, it's the unseemly Las Vegas or Amsterdam of its day. It's, it's, it's the most unexpected place that you could think of where God would want himself to be made known. In the context of Corinth, I want to give you that before I give you the statement that we relate to that in our application. Athens was uh, known for its education. Corinth was known for its entertainment. Athens was the intellectual capital of the world. Corinth was the immorality capital of Greece and the world. The root sin in Athens would be pride. Knowledge puffs up. The root sin of Corinth would be the lust of the flesh. Corinth was the largest and most cosmopolitan city of Greece in the first century. It's located at the southern end of the Isthmus, which is a narrow land bridge that connects the Peloponnesus with mainland Greece. It was a major center for commerce and trafficking. In its two ports, Lachium on the west, which gave access to the Adriatic Sea, and Centrea on the east, opening up the, the Aegean Sea, Corinth was a critical crossroads for east-west trade. While conceived as far back as 500 to 700 BC, and desired from those ancient times, there, there was a desire to cut a channel through that isthmus that would connect those two seas. And ironically, that was not developed uh, fully, and not fully uh, developed nor opened until 1883. I mean, they thought about it for 2,000 years and it didn't happen. It's called the Corinthian Canal, the Corinthian Canal. And as with all maritime ports, it attracted its share of undesirable activity. It was the crossroads of corruption. As if accentuating their sinfulness, the temple of Aphrodite, celebrating the Greek goddess of love, was perched high on the Corinth, on a hill that's called the Acro Corinth, or Mount Corinth, 1,900 feet above the uh, city itself. And it was uh, known, as uh, one writer says, for uh, at one time 10,000 temple prostitutes that came to that city and came from that city to display their crafts. Even the name Corinth became symbolic. And among the Greeks, the word translated to live like a Corinthian, to live like a Corinthian meant to live in deep immorality. So how will God, in his providence, make himself known in, in an unexpected place like this. Well, number one, it's in the players on Paul's team. Uh, he, he came and, and he found Aquila, a native of Pontius, who had recently come to Italy from Italy with his wife Priscilla because 
Watch this. Claudius, the emperor Claudius, had commanded all Jews in AD 49, two years before Paul comes to Corinth, Claudius had issued a decree because the Jews who had not come to Christ were, uh, you know, messing around and uh, having a disturbance with the Jews that did come to Christ in Corinth. And so Claudius just said, let's get them all out of here. And he expelled all the Jews from Rome because of a discussion around, if you go back and read the history, Suetonius, the first century Roman historian, says it was because all of that controversy started because of a guy by the name of Christus which is C-H-R-E-S-T-U-S, which is their way of spelling Christ. We know that Christ had a minister, or that uh, people had come to Christ because of Acts chapter two from Rome. Uh, people had been at Pentecost and had taken the gospel back there. Paul will write later to the Roman church that he's never been at because of what God was doing with them. But here is a, a, a Jewish couple named uh, Aquila and Priscilla, and, and they get kicked out of Rome and just so happen, quote unquote, to be at Corinth when Paul shows up. Now here's uh, the providence of God. Here is a believing Jewish couple from Rome who's in Corinth, and uh, they are believers, so there's Jewish heritage plus a, a believing faith. They just happened to have the same skills as the Apostle Paul, so when he gets there, he finds them, and they are tent makers by trade. But they're traveling people, as we'll find out. They're from Rome, they're in Corinth, they'll go with him to Ephesus, uh, they'll uh, go back to Rome later. So here is a, a, a power couple, we might call, believing people who share a heritage with Paul, share a skill and, a, and, a, and an occupational skill with Paul, and, are not, well, and are, are not afraid to travel for the cause of Christ. The providence of God behind that scene to help build that team. Amazing, amazing history, Aquila and Priscilla. The couple from Rome worked with Paul at Corinth. Later, as we'll see in this chapter, they traveled with him to Ephesus. They used their home as a house church, as we see in, in Romans chapter 16. And when Claudius died in AD 55, his edict was no longer in effect. They went back to Rome and were present in Rome when Paul writes Rome and he greets them at the end of Romans 16. A second example of, of merging providence for Paul and his team came with the arrival of Silas and Timothy. And if you read Philippians, Paul says that the Philippian church were the one church that really stood by and helped Paul. They gave a gift that Timothy and Silas brought, which then allowed Paul to not have to, 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 not have to make tents, but could give himself fully to the ministry. And that leads us then to the application. And that is this. Uh, you and I need to find a team of faithful people with whom you can do life with and encourage one another. That's the value of the small group ministry here at Christ Chapel. It's the value some of you have in, at, your, at your place of business where a group of, of believers gather together for a Bible study. Uh, there, there, there's a, a value of team. And, and the Bible talks about coming together to encourage one another to love and good works. That's, that's why we gather together on a Sunday like this to hear the word of God, to worship uh, the, the, the God of the word, and to uh, be encouraged to uh, stay at it and stay faithful in the midst of it. Find a group of faithful people with whom you can live the Christian life. Encourage one another. That leads us to a second way that God's providence works, and that is something that you and I need to remember as God calls us to witness and to make disciples, which is our vision as you hear over and over from our, the pulpit here. There, there's an, a, an important thing to understand about this decision making. And that is that we need to understand the justice that lies behind the grace message. We need to understand the justice that lies behind the message of God's grace in the person and work of Christ. When Paul and Silas arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied intensely with the word and testifying that Jesus was the Messiah, that the Messiah was Jesus. That's the message, Christ and the resurrection proves that. He whom you killed, God raised from the dead, God has made him both Lord and Christ, as we saw earlier in the book of Acts. That, that's the message of grace, that's the message of the gospel. But behind that lies also a principle of justice. Because when the message is shared, when the message is shared, there's two, re two reactions to it. There, there's reception and belief, 
but there's also rejection and unbelief. The person of Christ is the core of the message. But the problem of rejecting that message is self-condemnation. You and I need to understand that it's uh, our job to witness, it's not our job to convert. You've heard that before from this pulpit. That's the spirit of God's job, to con convict and convert. Ours is simply to communicate the message as clear as we can communicate it. And when a person responds to that message, of God's grace, they're responding to the fact that God has also already demonstrated justice in that he put our sins on his own son on the cross. He died the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. When we accept the message of grace, we are acknowledging that God has dealt with sin justly in the person of his son, and we are the recipients of the benefit of that by being saved, having our sins forgiven, and having the hope of heaven. But to reject that message of grace is to reject what God has done in Christ, which then places a person in a position of self-condemnation, and that's also a part of the justice of God. Let me give you a principle. Human beings can never take the credit for their own salvation. And God will never be charged with their condemnation for rejecting him. They bear that on their own. And that's why that's a critical decision to place before people. In fact, the passage in John chapter three, it says, whoever believes on him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. In other words, they're already under the sentence of death because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. There is an aspect of the message of God that's a message of love. But remember, Paul has two motives in 2 Corinthians when he says, the love of Christ constrains us to get, ask people to get reconciled to God. But in, earlier in that passage, it says, the terror of the Lord persuades us. Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men get reconciled to God. You see, the message of grace is only acceptable, is only available, I should say, because God has already dealt injustice with our sin. And that's why when we confess our sin, he's faithful to forgive us our sins. No, he's faithful and just while he forgives our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. You see, that was true when the moment we came to Christ, it's true every day of our experience with Christ. People who reject the truth bear the responsibility for their own judgment. In fact, there's an interesting prophetic imagery that Paul gives here to those who are rejecting and those who are opposing him. He shakes out his garments and he says, your blood be on your own heads, there in the text. Jesus used another ex expression in Matthew chapter 10 when he's telling the disciples to go out to the Jewish uh, communities and present the gospel. He said, if they receive you, give them a greeting of peace, shalom. But if they don't, shake the dust off your shoes and keep trucking. I mean, that's Jesus. He's a realist. <laughs> if they're not going to respond, just keep trucking. Don't, don't, you know, that doesn't mean we don't have to, a consistent witness over a, a period of time. But what he's saying is that uh, uh, you don't fret about that because there will be people who will reject the message. There'll be people who respond to the message. It's a message of grace, but it's also a message of justice. When he left there, verse 7, went to the house of a man named Titius Justice, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Here's Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, who believes in the Lord. I love that. The ruler of the synagogue, the, that Jewish sect that would be against Christ, he comes to Christ. You'd almost think God was in charge. You'd almost think he was at work. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. Here is the providence of God working in a city Vegas, Amsterdam, Austin. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> Where you don't think God is at work at all. God's at work. But no wonder the Jews reacted to have their synagogue leaders, and we're going to find out that's not the only synagogue leader that came to Christ. Sosthenes will come a little bit later in the passage. And that leads us to a third evidence of providence that comes directly from God to Paul. 
And this is where we find out that Paul evidently was having a rough time coming off of Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea and Athens. And as he says in Corinthians, of just that, that history of what he's gone through in his ministry on the first and second missionary journey, let alone what he'll go through on the third missionary journey, let alone what will happen to him on the way to Rome, as we'll see later in the book, the Lord shows up, the power of a promise. The Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. Don't you love that? I have many in this city who are my people. Now that's going to speak to two things. It's it's going to speak to God's protection, but it's also going to speak to God's election. That God has chosen people for himself. As Jesus said in the upper room, you did not choose me, I chose you and ordained you. You should go and bear fruit. We come by faith, but it's in response to initiating grace of God's call. But don't be afraid, God's speaking, don't be silent, I'm with you, I'll protect you. I have people in this city yet to be saved, he's saying. That promise reminds us then of the promises in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Jeremiah chapter one says, then the Lord said to me, you've seen well, for I'm watching over my word to perform it. Another one that's not in your notes is Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse six. Be strong and courageous, listen to this, do not fear or dread them, for it is your Lord God who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. I came across a piece written by a Cherokee Indian who was talking about the legends of his own tribe. And and, and I love, he says, that uh, one of the rites of passage was to take a young man and and put him out in the forest on 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 a log, on a stump, blindfold him, and he had to spend the whole night there listening to the howls and the winds and the, 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 the noises of nature. And he had, to, he had to do that the whole night out there by himself. And it was a rite of passage, at the end of which he could be considered sort of like a, you know, a, a, a man arriving at manhood. And so the uh, boy's not allowed to tell anybody else of their experience. He's blindfolded. And he's, allow, he's not allowed to take the blindfold off until the, the early rays of the sunlight the next morning come. The wind blows, the grass sort of whispers, there's strange noises, there's wild animals that he knows that are out there, there may be another human being who could cause him threat. But finally, it seems like eternity when the terrible night is over, the dawn's first rays of sunlight appear. The boy takes off the blindfold and sitting on the end of the log is his dad who's been there all night long. God doesn't sit on a stump or on the end of a log, but one of the promises that you find in the Old and the New Testament is I am with you, I'll never forsake you. Take courage, be strong. Be strong in the Lord, take courage, why? Because the Lord your God is with you. It happens over and over. Listen to Chronicles, He says, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. But then there's a little tiny warning there, but you've done foolishly in this, and from now on you're going to have wars. In other words, you can trust the Lord and be strong in the Lord, or you can face the consequences of not. It's an encouragement, and it's also a warning. But there's something else that happens in this passage, and it's found in verses 12 through 17, and let me just summarize it. Because uh, Gallio is proconsul of Achaia, and the Jews made a united attack against him, verse 12 talks about, and brings him before the tribunal, which is called the Bema. If you've ever been there, there's a rock wall that has a, a Bema seat sign on it. And Paul was about to open his mouth to defend him. Gallio said this to the Jews, if this were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it's a matter of question about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to judge any of these things. And he drove them out of the tribunal and they all see Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. And that leads us to the protection that God promises. Because uh, Gallio becomes the providential means by which God fulfills his promise to protect Paul. And there's 18 months of freedom that he continues to minister without threat in Corinth because of this. But the election of God, 
assures that many are in this city, and Sosthenes becomes the example of God's promise that there's others in Corinth. In fact, when you read 1 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, Sosthenes, who becomes a believer here, becomes the co-author of the book of 1 Corinthians, and it's from Paul and Sosthenes. You'd almost think God was providentially in control, and you should. But here's the fun part. It was in the early part of the 20th century that we found what's called the Delphi inscription or the Gallio inscription. And why this is important is that it, uh, it, it authenticates that Paul being in Corinth and Gallio being in Corinth, just as history has confirmed, it authenticates the historicity of Acts, but it also confirms the sovereignty of God because Gallio makes a decision that allows freedom, his decision as proconsul stands in the region that allows Paul to have an, a continual ministry for the rest of his ministry except when he gets arrested in Jerusalem and is sent to Rome. But in the providence of God, that allows for his end of the second missionary journey and the third missionary journey to take place. The providence of God. A, an edict from Claudius, the emperor, that causes Aquila and Priscilla to end up in Corinth, and Gallio, appointed by Claudius, by the way, to be proconsul of Achaia and especially stationed at Corinth, allows him to be in place when public policy is made that protects the right of the believer to share his faith. God works all things for the accomplishment of his will. The last paragraph is 18 to 23. Taking his leave, he said, I'll return to you if God wills. And he set sail from Ephesus, and after spending time there, he departs and went to a place to the next of the region of Galatia and Phrygia and the surrounding area, strengthening all the disciples. This leads us to a fourth that I want you to see, and that is this. Remember that making disciples is both a privilege and a mandate. It's a privilege in the fact he says, if the Lord allows. When I was president at Dallas Seminary, and God was uh, giving us opportunities in China and in the Spanish speaking world, the question that I raised with our administration, the question I would always raise with our board was what would God allow? What, what would God permit? If the Lord wills, Paul said, I'm gonna come back. He, you see, that, that phrase is a great demonstration of the doctrine of the providence of God. If God would allow this, if God would be pleased, if God would smile on this, we might be able to do this. And our uh, desire was to put Dallas Seminary's curriculum, not only our master's degree in Chinese, but also in Spanish, which we've done, but if the Lord allows, we think of Arabic, because with that language and English, 80% of the trade language combination and constant, you know, conversation of the world could take place. What, what would God allow becomes the question, if the Lord wills. Remember James has a great statement about that. He says, come now you who say, tomorrow or today, today or tomorrow we'll go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit, yet you don't know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you're like a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, We'll live and do this or that. You see, you see his humility in that statement, but you also see the priority in that paragraph where in all the travels that he's doing, he's strengthening the disciples. When you map that out, listen to this. This is on foot. We don't know anything about chariots with Paul, but he traveled over 2,000 miles on foot and a thousand miles by boat, just in that little paragraph of description. I've been in Turkey, I've been in Greece, I've looked at the mountains in Turkey and thinking Paul trekking through that section, I was amazed. The commitment, the priority, but he's saying if the Lord wills, we'll do this, but his strengthening the disciples was his priority, his priority. It was Lee Iacocca, who said the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And that's the great commission for us. Go, go 
make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, Jesus says, even to the end of the age. The pattern that we've seen throughout the book of Acts is when you witness, there will be opposition and there'll be reception. There's God's divine providential intervention through natural means and then his miraculous saving grace in which he supersedes the laws of nature and makes you and I a new creature in Christ by his spirit. And that results then in a growing church. So if I could leave you with some challenges. If you haven't, join a team of faithful Christ followers and be an encouragement to each other. If you're here without Christ, you need to understand the importance of a decision for Christ. And that is that uh, God has provided everything necessary for your salvation and mine through the death and burial and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. And to accept that on your behalf as a response of faith to God's grace, that's how you become a believer and have your eternity settled. For those of us who have made that decision, understand the importance of that as you and I share that with others. Because every time you share your faith, it's a cosmic decision that's made to say yes or no. But remember this, example of Paul, the example of others, when you, the tough, when the get going gets tough, we just heard it sung by the choir, remember that God is there with you. He'll never forsake you. He's working behind the scenes more than you know to execute his plan. And finally, take the Great Commission personally. And join a mission that has the biggest global vision cast that you could ever be a part of. And that's taking the gospel to the nations. As one church being a part of a mass of churches and being a part of the Church of Jesus Christ International at large, we get to do something that God is doing and we get to join him because he's at work. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for being not only a God of miracles but a God of providence. As Paul concluded in the end of that great doxology in Romans 11, for from you and through you and to you are all things. To you be the glory forever and ever. Thank you for working in a Roman emperor's life to issue a decree that would put comrades on the field for Paul to minister with. Thank you for decisions to appoint Gallio who would be there at the right time to defend Paul and to say, you know, this is an internal squabble with you Jews. Let him alone and the freedom that you grant. Lord, you raise up kingdoms and put them down. You're in charge of times and seasons, as the book of Daniel tells us. You are a God who is not ever out of control, but are always working to accomplish your will. At times, it's mysterious of what you allow in times it's mysterious what you cause, but that causes us to fall on our knees in worship. So help us, Lord, be strong. Help us be strong in you and take courage. For you are our God and you're at work in our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. In that privilege and mandate we can rejoice because the victory is his let's be strong in him in the lord as we stand and sing this closing song let's stand together and sing Henry. 
rejoice for the victory is yours. Be strong in the Lord together. Let's sing it one more time. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord and be of good courage for he is your God. Thank you, Josh. What an encouragement to be strong, not to just sing it, but to also hear it from the word. And just to connect some dots for you guys, Josh is the son of Dr. Bailey. So Josh Bailey, Dr. Bailey. Some of you went, oh, I never knew that. There's the, there's the, that's great. That's why I wanted to, to point that out. Um, so uh, yeah, power couple. There, there you go, right there. <laughs> Um, and thank you, Barbie, for all that you've done. There's Jeremy, brother, all, the whole family is right over here in the corner. You can go meet them all. Uh, so thankful for your ministry to us through the entire family. Uh, love you guys and so thankful. Uh, thankful that if you came for the first time, you chose to spend a part of your weekend with us. We want to help you on your spiritual journey. If you remember at the beginning of the service, uh, David Coots talked about how they've kind of rebranded the thing. We're talking about journey because we're all on a journey with Jesus, and that's never ending. We're always continuing to walk with him. If you need some next steps uh, that you could maybe take, maybe you want to be a part of this team called Christ Chapel, those wonderful folks that have certainly encouraged my walk with Jesus. I know that they would encourage yours as well. Please go out into the great room. Uh, you'll see a screen that looks like that uh, to, and the journey team that's there that will talk about some next steps that they can give you uh, that you can take in your walk with Jesus. Also, if you need prayer, I know David told you about those prayer cards. You can certainly drop in those prayer cards in those white boxes as you leave leave. But also, man, you don't have to leave here without us praying for you. We would love to be able to pray for you, pray along with you. So if you have anything that you need prayer for, there'll be some folks uh, here. But uh, I hope, man, what, what a brilliant message that Dr. Bailey brought about God's providence, that, that behind the scenes, he's working. He is always at work. So may God's providence inform your confidence as you walk with him this week. Amen. God bless you. We love you. We'll see you next week. What a beautiful day so far. As we go, remember that God is still God and he is still more. And that's not to dismiss whatever you're going through in the highs and the lows. It's an acknowledgement that we have a good sovereign God who's visible from both the mountaintop and the dark valley and who has more for us wherever we find ourselves. Be sure to let us know how we can pray before you go. And if you'd like to talk about God being more, have something we can pray for that comes up during the week or have questions, I hope you'll let me know. I'd love to help however I can. Until next time, keep your gaze fixed on him, as difficult as it may be at times. Know that we're praying for you, and we'll see you next Sunday for more in Acts.